What's up, Hyper Fast Nation? On this episode of the show, we've got a special guest. He owns and manages over a thousand real estate properties, and he has built several businesses spanning multiple areas in real estate from development, rehabbing, land development, subdivision. He has done it all. Welcome to the show, Van Sturgeon. Welcome to the show today, Van. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan, for having me. It's uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, meeting uh, for a while as this interview. So it's great to see you, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm I'm excited as well. I know you've got tons of experience in investing, and I think you're what up over like a thousand properties now that you uh, you know personally own or have managed or developed or what's what's kind of the count <laughs> I get that right? well, i'm actually uh i'm well over a thousand property rental properties is what i have like i've uh i got started in the business as a general contractor and then um in chicago in the uh early uh late 80s early 90s and uh during the process i kept running into the same people in that uh in the business over there of real estate investors and i sort of over a period of time kind of branched off into doing that uh, awesome. So uh, I, I'm still a general contractor. I still have a number of successful businesses in uh, in real estate, like property management, um, restoration work on uh, commercial buildings, and uh, and also I'm a subdivision builder as well. And uh, I'm also an, a real estate investor. Like I, as I mentioned, I have got a nice size portfolio of properties spanned over uh, Michigan, Ohio. I have some in Canada, New Brunswick, and also Florida. So those are the areas where I concentrate my investments in. So you've you've got like over three decades of experience doing this. I've seen multiple market cycles. So I know you're going to add just so much value to our listeners today. So I'm excited to have you on. Before we dive into some of the, the lessons and things that you specifically think realtors should get better at doing, uh, what, what background information or, or you know, bio should, should people know about you before we jump into some of the, the awesome advice you're going to give? Sure. I appreciate, uh, I, well, I, I've, uh, I've got an interesting uh, story to tell in that I, I, I'm a product of the, the late sixties, grew up in Chicago, uh, a product of uh, immigrant parents who um, worked their little tails off, saving their, saving their money with the hopes that they can, you know, achieve that American dream of buy owning their own home. So during that period of time, I was, we were living in a one bedroom apartment, my brother and I, four of us. And um, as my parents were working, accumulating this money, eventually um, they figured, they learned that the apartment building that we were living in actually had gone up for sale. So instead of actually going out and buying uh, their dream home, they went and became landlords. They purchased the property. And that happened in the late seventies. And it was around that time when they made that purchase, it was a beautiful building fully occupied that uh, the late seventies started kicking in, uh, you know, the, like the stu- like the rent hostage situation and the oil embargoes where I remember you know, waiting in line to pour gas in my car. Um, the economy was a disaster. Unemployment rate was very high. Interest rates were at 18, 22%. Like it was a really miserable time. So in that midst uh, of that situation, uh, yeah, uh, landlords who were living, who were in our area, the neighborhood, which was a good neighborhood, started turning bad because it's just people were moving out and all of a sudden crime and drugs and all that kind of st- stuff kind of moved in. And all of a sudden this beautiful apartment building started uh, to have a dramatic increase in vacancy, anywhere between 40 to 60%. And for a new real estate investor, that was, uh, that was something that you couldn't figure out and calculate for. And it, it really it really put us for a real spin. So it required us to um, really buckle down as a family and do everything possible in that apartment building ourselves. So from fixing a roof to replacing windows, carpeting, painting, plastering, you name it, we did it. Um, cleaning toilets. I don't know how many thousands of toilets I've cleaned in my life. 
And so it was that background that I had in growing up that eventually went off to university, um, could have became a lawyer, but I really had a love and passion for, for renovations and construction. And so that's the life I embarked on. I opened up my own general contracting business in Chicago. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was slowly growing my business, reaching out, creating relationships with people. And uh, as uh, eventually I kept, I kept running into the same people that were doing this, uh, real estate investors that were buying and selling properties, purchasing properties and holding onto them. And that's where then I embarked on, um, on another process uh, where I started to become more of a real estate investor. So I, I grew my general contracting business and I branched off into doing other things. At the same time, um, I kept accumulating rental properties um, and fixing and flipping as well. So you, you got an early taste of really the, the difficult side of it. Um, how did how did that you know end up for your parents uh, in the long term? Did they were they able to keep the building and, and get through it? Yeah, yeah, they they uh, they were able to get uh, get through that period of time. It was very difficult and trying, but we were able to hold on, and it, it turned out to being the great uh, a great great investment. Um, where yeah, I. I the value of the property over that period of time, you know, tripled. But it was a period of time where you needed cash flow in order to be able to pay your expenses, pay yourself, to pay mortgage. And there were a lot of uh, times where we just skimmed by. And I remember waiting in line uh, at the local food bank to collect a block of cheese or, or, or you know, artificial milk to be able to bring home so that we would have a little bit extra food uh, because there were just there were some difficult times. We didn't go to restaurants and and all that kind of stuff. So, and it's amazing what people can do if they really focus on a higher, you know, focus on a goal and being able to reach their goals. So you can, it's amazing what people can do if you're, if you're driven and focused. Yeah. I, I think it's an inspirational story just for, for a, what you said, buckling down, focusing, getting through it as a family and learning so many valuable lessons, but then also that you could have this, this terrible, unpredictable thing happen and, and, and still turns out to be a great real estate investment in the long run uh, because of the hard work you put in. Sure. But also, Dan, let me tell you too, also that, that, you know, any kind of trauma like that leaves an emotional impact that you carry the baggage you carry. Some of it's good and some of it is bad. Like in growing my business because of the background I had in my, in my childhood or, you know, the teen years set me up well to be able to move into general contracting, but it also was a detriment to my development as well, because, what I, was end up, what I ended up doing was I became a, a, a perfectionist, a micromanager. I couldn't hire people or, or, or really you know, divide, 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 divulge myself of the responsibilities of that kind of stuff because I had to do everything myself because I was the only one that could do it and I needed to save as much money as possible. And so eventually what ended up happening is I had this growing business as a general contractor, but then at the same time I was growing as well as a real estate investor doing flips. And that came to a breast where I was burning candle at both ends and got to a point where I remember I was sleeping on job sites. And one particular job site I was sleeping there, uh, I'm staring at a freshly painted ceiling and all these troubles and issues associated with this flip that had gone bad kept, you know, were overwhelming. And as a result, I, I had to, uh, I almost had a nervous breakdown. And I knew that this wasn't right to what, how, the way I was doing things. And I reached out to uh, a real estate investor of, uh, that was uh, that was there that I had gotten to know an older fellow that was seemed like he had it all. He was fit. He was tan. He had everything that you could possibly think of in terms of a beautiful real estate portfolio. And I reached out to him for help. And he uh, thankfully he accepted. And I, I, I he coached me. He coached me through that process of trying to figure out how to plan, how to you know how to develop myself as a successful entrepreneur, successful real estate investor. And then, um, and then through that process, uh, it's probably the best investment I ever made in my life. And I've continued to make those investments in, in books and seminars and coaching that has produced a person that I am today. How, how did your background um, prepare you for the different market cycles that, that you've gone through? Being someone that's been doing this for a while, you've seen some up and down markets uh, more than once. How did, how did that, you know, initial experience shape that? And then like, how do you, how do you, how do you go about investing and continuing to grow and do more deals? 
uh, and surviving the downturns that, that, that come in the cycles? Well, I, I, uh, I, I was fortunate that I've always had uh, <clears throat> cash flow coming in from uh, other, other businesses. Like, so for my general contracting, I, I was able to uh, develop that business and I create relationships with cash flows coming in. That, be, that being said, um, there were opportunities where we were, were had to buckle down and not make as much money on a flip, for example, or maybe even break even uh, when I got caught with my pants down in a particular Michael, a particular cycle, and when a particular cycle turns. Uh, nobody's got a crystal ball. Uh, if that was the case, uh, you know, there would be guys that we, we would be able to run out and pick stocks in the stock market and do very well. So uh, ultimately, I always looked at a situation in buying, uh, money's always made on the buy, and finding and acquiring property is extremely important in, in, in that aspect. So even if there is a market correction, there's enough of a cushion there to be able to sort of alleviate that fall or that loss. Um, and then, uh, you know, you really got to be diligent on the numbers associated with every project and making sure that you know, the, you've accounted for a lot of contingencies and you build in certain things there to be able to avoid, uh, you know, a c- catastrophe. I came close. I'm not, I, there are situations in uh, 2001, in 2007, 8, where, uh, you know, there weren't, there weren't pleasant times and there was a lot of uh, fear uh, during that period of time. But in being able to quickly transition out of that fear, I've actually grew my, I grew my portfolio dramatically during those periods of time because as people were running out, I was running in. Mm. So you were, you were zigging when they were zagging. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that requires as much uh, force. Uh, that, like, that requires, um, again, it's all relying on numbers. Like I was looking at, at the time when I was looking at properties and for example, in Florida that had appreciated in value from 150,000 all the way up to 450,000 and then started to crawl back and settle at 150, 120 over a course of a five year, seven year period of time. And you're renting them out for $1,200, $1,500 a month. The numbers just, the numbers didn't lie. It's just a matter of uh, putting a case plan together and reaching out to, to financial institutions who are more than willing to uh, co- you know, work deals at the time uh, to be able to take over portfolios of properties and, and do well. So um, there's an old saying, you know, you catch fish in muddy waters, not in clear waters. So, but to really answer your question, um, uh, which was a, how did you, how were you able to navigate away from these issues or troubles? Um, it was simply just building enough contingencies in that, that in the event, if there was a turn, you're able to be able to at least break even. And that's all I've always, I've always been a person that chased after cash flow and not property appreciation. So there's markets out there, um, you know, and we know them all in California and New York and places like that, where it's all based on capital. It's all based on appreciation, nothing on, on cash flow. And I, I never, I stay away from those markets. I always wanted to be able to sleep well at night, knowing that even if I bought a property that was valued at 200,000 and it dropped in value by hundred to, you know, to hundred thousand, the rental income off of that property was still going to be able to offset all my carrying costs associated with it. So what's, that's what's how your, I always looked at it. What's your typical deal? You know, you threw out the 200K number, but are you, are you, you know, what's, what kind of properties are, are you buying uh, specifically for cash flow? Hey, hold that thought for a minute. Do you have a client that needs to buy or sell a home in the DMV area? Then why not trust the highest selling team in the DMV, the Carrie Scholl team? We've helped thousands of buyers and sellers and would love to help your clients. And we guarantee we will save them time, money, and stress throughout the process. And they will be so grateful that you referred them to us. Go to carryshoal.com to learn more. Again, that's carryshoal.com to learn more about sending us your clients that need to buy or sell a home in the DMV area. That's carryshoal.com. In the areas that I'm concentrating on in, in the, 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 the in the metropolitan Detroit area, metropolitan Cle- Cleveland area, there are significant opportunities as they are throughout the United States. These are areas where there, you can purchase value, uh, you can purchase properties that require uh, some renovation, some upkeep. And then uh, through that process, you're able to raise a value, uh, refinance out, and you've got a nice income producing property 
that you can add to your portfolio. The only issue with that is that some of these properties, like banks, the type A financial institutions don't want to lend out on a $60,000, $100,000 property. They're looking for something with some more breadth, $150,000, $250,000. So uh, to sort of mitigate that, to sort of circumvent that, um, there are type B uh, financial institutions out there. There are investors out there that maybe you might be able to, may, you might have to, and you will have to spend a tick up or uh, tick up on interest rates, but um, you'll be able to get the money that you need to be able to move forward and uh, purchase uh, purchase that property, or you you know get to a point where you bundle them together, then you go to a type A financial institution. So, so I'll bundle. I'll bundle. You're getting up for under under hundred k typically. Yes. Wow. Yes. My, my, like I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, there are in those areas, there are good, good quality properties in uh, some markets that are moving in the right direction that you can purchase uh, that require some work that you can purchase in that $50,000 range. And then you can, you know, sprinkle some cosmetics in it and, and then eventually you should be able to do quite well with it. And then get rental out of it, depending on the size of the property, should be able to get a rental rate and it refer between $1,000 to $1,200 a month. So numbers wow. don't lie. The numbers yeah. don't lie, Dan. <laughs> those, are, those are solid numbers, to say the least. Um, what, what do you think, you know, we were talking earlier before the show, a lot of agents, um, I think, miss out on opportunities to A, do this for themselves and B, do this for other investors. Like, why do you think that is? And if, if you're a real estate agent, you know, listening to this, or, or I guess, what would you say to a real estate agent listening to this? I'll tell you that I, over the 30 years that I've been doing this, I have struggled with that, that, that dilemma of uh, some real estate investors uh, will encourage you to go become a real estate agent, salesperson. Others will not. And I've always been debating that, and I don't know the answer to that. There are definitely advantages that real estate agents have that I do not have, just by the sheer nature of you being involved in a marketplace where other people are in that industry, they're coming across information, and you're sharing that information is something that you can use to your, to your benefit to grow, to start, and to grow a portfolio. That obviously I, as a, as a real estate investor, doesn't have that insight. Um, now, over, obviously, over the course of the last 30 years, things have changed because we have the introduction of the internet and information is so readily available to people that is sort of, sort of circumvented the, the, the process or the, uh, not circumvented the process, but it circumvented the power that the real estate agents used to have in the marketplace where they were the sole controllers of that information. Like I remember the good old days where I had to literally hop in my vehicle, drive over to my local real estate agent and sort of beg and plead and have a relationship with them to get that big fat book that had all the MLS listings in there. And you would go through those page after page of listings that popped up and try to see and identify opportunities. Obviously that doesn't really exist anymore because everything is online. And as a result, it's become extremely more competitive, not only on the investor side, but also as a real estate agent where uh, you know, you got to figure out now what is your need? Like, what is it that you are providing to that individual is looking to buy a property? How do you differentiate yourself from that computer who already has that information? And one of the things I, that, uh, that I suggest, and we kind of talked off, uh, off the air about is, you know, this notion or idea of adding value to the relationship that you create with a, with a client, where you being able to, as a real estate agent, walk into an investment property or any property and come up with some idea or a sense of what the what should be renovated and what the costs are associated with that renovation. And going to that client of yours and saying, yeah, this is what I believe based on my experience, what it's, you know, the is this a good purchase or it's not a good purchase? And if that, if that makes sense, I think it does. Yeah, how, how hard is that process to, for an agent to go out and learn? Well, I, first of all, I, I think that it's, um, it's available to everybody that's willing to put in the effort to, uh, to understand what the, really the fundamentals associated with what a renovation should be. Um, oftentimes when I, when I encounter new real estate investors who want to get into this, um, they don't, there's a lack of, inform, there's a lack of 
uh, of um, work uh, that they've done to get the information necessary to be able to figure out what it is that's needed in their marketplace. So one of the things that uh, real estate uh, Real estate agents and also new real estate investors should do if you really want to be successful and learn the whole process of renovating is first, before you do anything, you got to figure out what it is that you need to renovate. And then you need to have a clear understanding of that particular market or submarket. What are the demands associated with that? So, for example, if, uh, if you're looking for to purchase a property and make $30,000 on a flip and you see that potential in that property, you need to know and understand what it is that you need to do to that property in terms of renovation. And so does it need a new kitchen? Does it need new windows? Does it need new carpeting? And be able to get that. There's opportunities to figure out the rough costs of all those things uh, to a property, but you need to have that information on figuring out what it is that you need to do to that property that new real estate investors sort of fail to go out there and do. I hope uh, real estate agents do their due diligence as a service and they should do that. They should understand their market. But real estate investors, I often find, don't have that information. And so maybe that's something that real estate agents mm -hmm. could bridge for, to the real estate, to this new real estate investor, is sort of give them the lay of the land of that particular marketplace where that property, per, that property is up for sale to help them along. Like those are the, really the first things that one should for, sort of have an idea of or an understanding of what to do in figuring out what the renovation should be, is that. Then... I mean, then when you get into the actual minutia and trying to figure out it was, it was, well, if you know what is required in a property, then you, should, then you can figure out, okay, the costs associated uh, with it. How do you do that? Well, you know, simple arithmetic in terms of the square footage of an area and reaching out to a hardwood floor guy or a tile guy should give you an idea or a sense of how much that renovation or that repair should cost. Um, there's really a, a system associated with a successful renovation where you don't overspend on your budget. You don't overspend your budget. You avoid bad contractors and you raise the value of your property. Um, and it is a system that I've sort of created over the last 30 years of my uh, real estate investment career. I've, I've literally done thousands of renovations from apartments to single family homes to you know, office buildings. Well, I, I think it's definitely a skill as an agent. Like if you could pick this up, acquire, put the time in to know how to estimate repair costs, know how to estimate, you know, what things will sell for at various renovation levels. Uh, it's, it really gives you a good opportunity to pick up repeat clients. Because if you do this for an investor, they're, they're not like a homeowner that's going to go do it once every five years, right? They're, they're going to want to keep doing it more and more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I think that as a real estate agent, you've got to, you got to niche it down. You can't be everything to everybody. I think that I'm pretty sure that's one of the things you talk about with the folks that you deal with is you got to niche it down to, to get down to the exactly who is your uh, avatar, who's the person you want to do business with and attract. And then I strongly encourage you that uh, to folks that you should really consider that a new real estate investor and get them under, take them under your wing because it would be a repeat customer. Um, and you can establish a relationship with that individual. And it's funny how once you establish a relationship and you do good work with one investor, then all of a sudden other investors start to come in and you create, a, you create an audience, you create, you create clients. It's not easy, but definitely if you take the right steps, you should be able to do that. And never mind the, the, whole, uh, situ uh, the whole thing about having that skill set so that you then also can embark on a real estate investment career as well. If you have that skill set, you should be able to be able to walk into properties and assess them right away and say, yeah, this is a good deal or it's not. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the I've never really understood how successful real estate agents, you know, don't add development or flips or rental to, to their overall portfolio because they're around it all the time. They have access to, to good deals or they should if they're they're good at their job. And, and, you know, if, if you don't do that, I guess my question would be to them, like, what are you doing to build systems so that you're not always in this trap of trading time for money? Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I have relationships and know of real estate agents that have been in the business just as long as I have been, who seem to be quite successful in that I, you see their signs, uh, you know, periodically on properties for sale or, or in a transaction and they go off to retire and they don't have really much in the way 
uh, after after their career because they didn't take you know they didn't take uh, the extra step into making some investments in the in real estate and seeing that grow. There's a reason why 90% of the you know the millionaire billionaires in the world are in real estate. It's because it's it's a it's a beautiful form of investment that you can leverage and has go has had a consistent pattern of continuous growth in terms of appreciation and plus cash flow. It produces cash flow if you buy right, and it's a great investment and it's something that will pay for itself. And per, if you structure it properly, you'll be able to put a couple of dollars in your pocket every month. And so why more real estate agents don't embark on that? I don't know. I wish they would because there's opportunities that they have that you folks have because of the information relationships you have that I perhaps don't because I'm an outsider. So I encourage. I agree. Uh, you've, you've gone from, you know, obviously at some point you, you had one apartment building or parents did, and then you went out and did your first deal at some point. How did, how did you scale what you do now? Cause you know, the numbers we mentioned at the beginning are, are fairly staggering. Like what kind of team or other stakeholders have you had to bring on and, and really how have you created the ability to, to do what you do at scale? Hey, hold that thought. Do you want to get a hundred tips for free from my best selling real estate book, the hyper local, hyper fast real estate agent. If you do, Go to hyperfasttips.com and you can download a hundred of my best tips today. Again, that's hyperfasttips.com. You can download a hundred tips on how to grow your business, get more clients, deliver more value to more people. Go to hyperfasttips.com. Hey, I never really planned on this, because, uh, Frank, honest with you. I just, I just want, I knew that I loved uh, renovating. It, it was, it was, it felt home to me. I loved it. And I got involved in the business. So I started this business and I started to grow it. And I kind of knew what, what people needed in the work that was required. And, and I, I was a natural at it. Um, as, the biggest, as the business grew, eventually I had to get to the point where, and that's where, this, where the mentorship, this coaching came into play, where they helped me structure my business and my outlook and my mindset and how to move the ball forward and it, it wasn't something that was planned out, but it just it just happened that after I uh, uh, created a successful general contracting uh, company, um, it was natural for me to move to land development, where um, I started building custom homes. From custom homes, it went into subdivisions, and I still do that. Um, on the on the on the real estate investment side, after I created a portfolio and I hit the 60, 70 property mark. Um, I was paying a, a property manager to look after my properties. But then I realized, why am I doing that? Why am I giving up control over my properties? Why don't I, I've got to scale right now. Why don't I go out and create my own company? And so that's what I did. I, I hired a, a, a property manager and I created a property management company that also grew because of the relationships that I had with other real estate investors through my general contracting. So one kind of became one layer into another, into another. And then when, by virtue of, of the cash flow that was coming in for my properties and I'd done very well, um, my relationships with other real estate investors, it's just, it's like, a, it's like this four seasons, you know, you got winter, summer, fall, spring. And so as a real estate investor, uh, if you got relationships with other real estate investors, you come across situations where portfolios of properties come up for sale where a guy's got 70, 80 units, uh, guy's got 430 units. And if, if you structure the deal properly and you've got, you know, if you've got relationships with investors and private money, uh, there's things that can be structured. So that's how I, that's how I branched off it. I, I uh, never really got into, I participated in syndication, but I never got involved in syndication. I've never formed one. Um, I've always been content with what I've had and the mixture of properties I have roughly speaking is, 60% multifamily and 40% single family. And a lot of people look at that uh, breakdown of be like, why, why are you still holding on to the single family? And the reason why is because it's just, it's just, it, it's, it's paid for itself. It just produces money. So, and I've got these businesses that support it. So why, why get rid of it? So I, I keep it around it. Some people say it's a lot of hassle, but uh, I, I'm, I'm good with that. I enjoy my properties. So well, you, you've been able to it. scale it. You, yeah, you've been able to scale it to the level where, like, I'm sure you're not 
fixing toilets anymore, right? Like you've got no. companies that do this for you. And right. I mean, there's there's actually big investment firms that go around and like buy up single family homes to, to do exactly this. And you've got that, that portfolio. That is actually, that's one of the interesting phenomena because what you're seeing is now a migration lower to the, to the smaller apartment building, even to the point where portfolios of single family homes are being put together by these investment hedge funds because they steer, they need to, they need the, uh, they need the, the, they need interest rates. They need the, the return on the ROIs and they can't get them from the good old US savings bond or places like that. And so they're, now they're, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing, um, you're seeing a massive appreciation in real estate aside from the inflationary concerns is that you've got people running, chasing after smaller and smaller rates of return. So it's become, it's become quite, uh, it's become an interesting time, definitely. I don't see it. I don't see it continuing for very long. Uh, for every up, there's a down, and we've gone up for quite a bit of for quite a period of time. And I think that there's going to be. Uh, we'll see how things develop. There's things that are going on in Washington to see that might very well change things, and also just naturally the economy, how things are uh, dramatically, how inflation is dramatically increased, um, is uh, in, in, a, in a in a in a normal world, uh, typically forces interest rates to rise. And if that happens, then it'll be interesting to see how inter how uh, how real estate will fare. Yeah, on, on that note, I mean, the, the Fed, I think there was the Fed chair recently said, like, money supply doesn't matter anymore. This is after, I think, it's kind of a well-known fact that came out, money supply has increased by about 30% or so in the last year. Like, I mean, where, where do you see... Like these, in, do you think these inflationary policies will continue, and what effect will that have on real estate? What do, what do, what do you think might happen in Washington, and how that would affect real estate? Then, then that would mean <laughs> that I would have to whip out my crystal ball and tell you, and I'm horrible at that, and I think most people, in fact, in fact, everybody is good at that. As meaning, people, intelligent, very successful people will tell you a. I can find just as many smart, intelligent people will tell you the cop complete opposite. Uh, my personal opinion is, is that every single day, uh, there are opportunities that exist all around us in real estate. Real estate is the, uh, is the greatest uh, uh, vehicle to use toward uh, financial freedom. And so I, I, my inbox is full every day and my team's inbox is full every day with opportunities. And they, they exist whether good times or bad times. Um, it's just a matter of getting in that proper mindset to be able to seize on those opportunities and create those opportunities and networking and the meeting with people and getting out there and finding those, those opportunities. Uh, what's going to happen? I don't know. I, I, the Fed can say a lot of beautiful, wonderful things along the way, but, at the, but facts are the facts. And if you've increased the money supply at that dramatic of a rate and you've taken on so much good and bad on your balance sh uh, sheet, and there's, uh, that's, there's ramifications associated with that. When will that happen? Don't know. Also, I will also say that uh, USA, the greatest country in the world, is not the only place that that is happening to. Everywhere around the world, everywhere, everywhere around the world, whether it's in China, Germany, everybody's printing money like crazy and throwing it out. And, and uh, we'll see what the ramifications are to it. Definitely we'll see changes. We will see um we will see, you know, we see it all around us that, you know, uh, information, uh, access to information is readily available. And more and more, especially with digital currency and the way government is able to track where your money is going is going to increase dramatically as we move forward and how the technology develops. So, uh, you know, taxes are going to increase. And by virtue of government maybe being able to track how, where your money is going, um, is going to produce the kind of money that they will need to, to pay for all this kind of stuff that they're throwing out there. Who knows? Ultimately, at the end of the day, I always look at the glass half full. I think there's opportunities every single day. It's just a matter of going out there and finding them. I agree. I think, I think no matter what the market does, there's opportunities and there's ways to make money. Um, this has been a great, great, great show. I really think you've added a ton of value and just given some really great advice to real estate agents out there about how and why they, they need to look at 
getting into investing, I always like to wrap up with a hyper fast round if you're ready for some rapid fire questions and answers. I will do the best that I can. Fire off. Awesome. What's your biggest piece of advice to a new real estate agent in this market? Uh, the biggest advice is that you need to be uh, to niche it down and you need to create a differentiator uh, in the marketplace. What separates you from the rest of the pack is extremely important. And that's the differentiator between a successful real estate agent and one who's not. What, what's something that you commonly see experienced investors do that's a mistake? Um, they constantly um, rely on others to do the information uh, gathering and not do it themselves. Uh, a lot, I find a lot of people are lazy and not being able, not going out there and doing their due diligence on whatever property or investment vehicle, whatever that they're planning on doing. There's a lack of infor- lack of intense uh, yeah, reaching for getting the information necessary to be able to make accurate decisions. What's the biggest challenge you've had in business and how did you overcome it? Uh, my biggest problem was uh, changing my mindset because uh, I had a mindset, as I touched on earlier, that was uh, a micromanager, a perfectionist. And that's no way to be able to scale a business or really become a successful business owner. Um, and the only way that I was able to get out, get over that was actually hiring and having a coach who walked me through and tried to, and, and we, and the reason why I'm as success today is because of that, because that, uh, that investment is the best investment I ever made in my life. What's, uh, or what would we find you doing when you're not working on real estate or your businesses? Really, my time is preoccupied uh, in things that I really enjoy. And right now, I really, I, I really enjoy uh, folks that reach out to me and they have a, they have a renovation that they're, that they're doing and I'm helping them through the process. And at the end, the, the, seeing how empowered they are, it adds really so much happiness uh, to my life because I'm somewhere to retire right now. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not involved in the day-to-day operation of my businesses. And right now I'm just dealing with folks who just want to learn how to do a plan, a successful uh, manage plan and manage a successful renovation. And by helping them it just really fills my soul. And I enjoy, I enjoy the process. So that's what I do for fun right now. I, I, I'm not a guy who grabs a block of wood and wills it to a coffee table. Uh, I'm not a stamp collector. I'm not that kind of guy. I just enjoy, those are the simple things that I, that I, that I enjoy right now. All right. Last one. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I think that uh, I'm, I think I, I found my calling because uh, there was a lot, there was a period of time where I was doing some soul searching when I made the decision sort of downshift in my life and go get into that semi-retirement stage. And I was trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do with myself because I'm not a golfer. I'm not anything like that. And so I wasn't, it was because of this happens chance situation where I get a phone call from a friend of mine who was interested in renovating their home, helping them through that process and discovering that this is really what I enjoy doing and then embarking on this. And I see myself doing this uh, for you know 10 years from now because I really got all this bottled information of experiences and tips and secrets that I've accumulated over over this uh, period of time in my life that I want to share with others and help them succeed. I, I really enjoy the process. So that's what I, I see myself in 10 years time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and all of the value you have provided. Before we sign off, if people want to connect with you, learn more about what you do or anything like that, how should they do it? Well, I'm all over social media. If you just Google Schmoogle my name, you'll be able to find me in, in places like that. I really encourage people, if you want to learn more about me in particular, learn more about planning and managing renovations, to go to my website at vansturgeon.com. There, you'll be able to uh, see that I've, I've been on a number of podcasts like, your, like yours. There's a number of articles I've written that have been picked up on a bunch of publications to talk about planning and managing renovations, about real estate investing. Also, I, I've got a free renovation calculator that's on my website that I encourage people to download. It's a calculator that you can use that you put the information about your property, the square footage, the things that you want to do to, to the property, and it spits out a number, a budgetary number that will help you sort of figure out what the costs are for the renovation of a, this particular property. And also, I'm offering a free training video for you know, to walk you through the process of how to plan and manage your own renovation. So I encourage everybody to, uh, if you're interested, to go there and uh, 
and get, you know, get all this free advice and information. I want to help people. I really do. Because I know the fears that's associated with people embarking on their first renovation. I want to help them out. Awesome, Van. Well, we appreciate it so much. This has been amazing. Everyone who's been tuning in, listening, watching, please leave us some comments, give us some feedback and share this episode with people that you think could benefit from knowing about it. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests, improve our shows, and give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos.